It's 1.18 a.m. at your 36th birthday party, and you're listening to Night Call. Hello, and welcome to Night Call, a podcast for your strange days and lonely nights. I'm Tess Lynch here in L.A., and with me is Molly Lambert, and joining us as always in New York, Emily Yoshida. Hi, guys. We're se- separated hi, by an hi. entire country again. Missing Although I-, I was telling Molly when I said farewell for the last time before I left that maybe I would just stay, and y- you might not know the difference. You know, you also may be back in a week. So. Well, <laughs> right? No, not maybe. I will be back. I will not. But we do. Yeah. we do have a ghost mic set up for you today. We're <laughs> looking right at it. <laughs> Please it's put like beautiful. some hair on yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really fun adventure that I told you guys about right before I left on maybe the second to last day before I left. Um, and then I feel like we all had stories that were somewhat what, like this from our, our years spent in Los Angeles. Um, but I am um, I am a person who likes to hike. Also, shout out to Outside Magazine, who shouted us out uh, recently in a post uh, of recommendations. We love to be recommended by people who like the outdoors because we are stealth outdoor people ourselves, even though it might not seem like that at the outside. No, it's true. We're I- we're indoor kids, but we also love we love the outdoors. Yeah. I like to look outdoors from indoors. <laughs> <laughs> That you too. like greenery. I've seen you. No, I love greenery. You love trees. I like to sit outside. Yeah, you like to be outside. <laughs> I do. It depends on the weather. I'm wearing gloves inside right now. <laughs> They're fingerless gloves. I love a good exterior. Uh, we'll get to sit. that later. <laughs> um, um, but I was. Uh, I did a hike. I had been feeling very, very um, stifled by my schedule and not being able to hike, even though the weather was beautiful in Los Angeles after the rain went away. It was like my favorite kind of LA weather. Um, so I eventually did get out, snuck away to go do a hike at Runyon Canyon. I don't do Runyon Canyon a lot, and I didn't do it a lot when I lived there. Um, and I feel like every other time I go to Runyon, something weird happens. Like, I get lost. A lot lost. of snakes up in Runyon. A lot well, of snakes. Well, I've run into snakes in Griffith. I don't know that I've ever run into a snake in Runyon, now that I think of it. I think I always start thinking about pumas in Runyon for some reason, even though <laughs> I think there are more of those in Griffith Park. But I... Uh, they're t- the, the other kind of pumas at yeah. Runyon. <laughs> you know well, if, if, we all, if we all get together for a hike, then yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always something about the dismount at Runyon Canyon tends to throw me for a loop. Something weird happens. And this time I was trying to get back and I was sort of pressed for time because I was really squeezing in this hike because I needed to get back home, shower, so I could go out for a meeting. And I found myself kind of in this weird area that didn't really seem like it was part of Runyon Canyon, which I guess is the Waddles Garden. And I was like, oh, well, it's really close to Curson Street. I can just like, it looks like the path goes out. There's an exit out onto the street there. I'd never been to this part of the park before. And I don't know how I got there because I don't think I was doing anything weird. But um, so I followed this path that was on Google Maps. And then there was a gate that was closed and locked like with a chain link gate. And I... Uh, I could see through it went t- into this path and it, as far as I could tell from the map if I kept going I would get to the street <laughs> so I um I hopped the fence which I was telling you guys I was very impressed with myself for being able to do uh in my old age I did poke a hole in my running leggings I discovered late uh, later so the the victory was a little bit diminished but then uh I got on the other side and I found myself in this like empty, spooky, like very opulent courtyard with fountains, uh, this kind of Spanish style courtyard. And I could see down that there was this mansion there, this completely empty mansion, like, and there were just all these like kind of fallen leaves around. And there was one groundskeeper there who was sweeping. I I was very careful to use my highest pitched, least threatening voice to (laughs) announce my presence to him. But so it's kind of like in Runyon Canyon. I looked it yeah, up. Yeah, it's I was at the like, foot oh. of Runyon Canyon. The estate is called the Waddles Mansion. 
named for Gurdon Waddles, banker, yeah, wealthy, we all... wealthy Omaha banker Gurdon Waddles. I had never heard of it before, but Tess had not only heard of it, but been there. I had indeed. Yeah. The year was 2010. Mm-hmm. Picture it. I'm wedding scouting for a place to have a wedding. And I think you can just waltz in if you do it from the street. There's a parking lot. Yes. Um, and then you go in and there are a bunch of uh, like little seating areas. There's a pond with some turtles. The park yes. is open to and the koi. public sometimes. It is, I, I mean, well, I thought it was kind of always is, open. The garden is like this public garden and it was... You can't go into the mansion though. No. It's owned by the state. That yes. is what is interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely but like related recently. to the park in that it's... It says it's like an old, such an old mansion that it dates back to when it was like a hacienda for a rich person from somewhere right. else for the winter. Yeah, it was it was uh-huh. a Somebody's- winter home for this guy from Omaha, this rich guy from Omaha, which is crazy to think about. Well, I one of my favorite, like, not very, like, obscure facts, but fun facts about Los Angeles is that Western Avenue is called Western Avenue because it used to be, like, the westernmost street in LA. Oh, really? Uh, which now like runs through Koreatown, which is basically like right in the middle of what we consider the city, but like everything everything to the west of that was really considered like the hinterlands. Well, I saw they have really great archival um photos of Franklin Village, which is kind of just west of Western mm-hmm. around like, you know, Bronson Canyon and Beechwood and stuff. Yeah. And in the 30s, it was like, I mean, it, it a lot of it was like farming yeah, in yeah. the 20s, too. It was really like country-ish. Well, wow, well the like Waddle's this Garden about... was a farm. Like that was another oh. fun thing I discovered. And it went into like major disrepair in the 70s and 80s and was used as... Oh, right. They said it was like a punk hangout. Yeah. 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 This is interesting because a lot of the stuff about it sounds really similar to Tompkins Square Park, which we'll mm-hmm. get to yeah. later in a later yep. segment. <laughs> But it was like it was like an open place for people to congregate and then people congregated yeah. there. So they closed it. Well, that was why I really when we were planning our wedding, we were just it was like a very small wedding and we were just looking for just a place that wouldn't be like too far from everybody kind of lived in the same vicinity. So we were like, oh, we'll just find a place that's central. And Waddles has so many rules. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's I don't want that for a <laughs> wedding. But I mean, it makes sense. But it's kind of a bummer considering that it was a punk hangout yeah. and everything that it's like very strict. It used to, I think, be a lot more sort of atmospherically decrepit. Um, and I, I found it was a location in a Diana Ross music video from 1985, for a song called Eaten Alive, <laughs> uh, which sort of like seemed like her Perfect. stab at a thriller. But um, you can look it up. I'll put it on the Twitter. It's a very low res movie or video, but you can kind of see that the, it wasn't like there were like vines growing and stuff and all this, you know, it was really kind of crumbling. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, it apparently has themed gardens. And yes. It's one of the first tourist mm-hmm. attractions with the themed gardens. Well, look who did her homework. Look who read the Wikipedia. Look who read the <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> I was inspired by Emily's trip into Waddles to finally go to Brand Park. You were? Ooh. I was. I didn't know this. Yes, but I didn't. It was late, so I didn't venture all the way up to the, the haunted super part. haunted part. Because I'm scared. Well, it's scary. <laughs> it is. But did you go, like, did you drive through the big res- around. resplendent gate? Yeah, I did. It is a very resplendent gate. And uh, I took my daughter up to the library, which is like, it's a beautiful so beautiful. Library. What the a beautiful most library. Beautiful building. Yeah. it's it, And the, there's like a little tea room that, I, that was closed. I did almost get into like an altercation with someone, though, who parked taking up two spots <laughs> in front of me well, and we glared like- at each each other and then we had to push our kids next to each other on the swings which is something that happens like it's not the first time that's happened to me but that was that was my hiking experience did you feel the spirits around you totally felt the spirits i it was really beautiful but it also got me thinking about glendale how glendale is like the suburbiest you yeah. know yeah has such a different vibe it's creepy because it's sort of not in the middle of nowhere, but like in the middle of like a really rich neighborhood. Well, it starts to feel yeah, like the like rest of America turnoff. in a way, like Glendale mm-hmm. does. It's like on the cusp there. This park is weird because it feels like it's like a World's Fair type thing. And then yeah. when I looked it up, it was designed by the architect who designed, I think, the Chicago World's Fair, which is like the devil oh, in the right. white city yeah, World's yeah. Fair. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I wonder if it was the same landscape architect. Well, apparently it was like it has – it's very like Spanish, fake Spanish castle kind of looking. And right. apparently it was like so – People liked it so much that that's why everyone started making their own houses fake Spanish. The, like, Spanish revival? Yeah. it's. I mean, it's truly beautiful. There's something very kind of threatening about that architecture, though. Just it's, a lot of, like... It's a little fascist. Yeah, a little bit fascist. <laughs> uh, but, so yeah, it was beautiful. It's, like, Wagnerian. Yeah. Fascist. Exactly. Like yeah. a World's Fair. Exactly. <laughs> Some of you may not know. The Olympics were originally just tagged on to the World's Fair. Um, would you guys like to take a night call? Yeah, let's Absolutely. take a night call. Speaking of, of plants and shrubbery. Hey, this is Gloria. I'm calling with a question. Um, so I just moved across town. I moved from one part of Los Angeles to another. And I had two plants suddenly die in my kitchen, two plants that I've had for years. And nothing really changed except for the house that I'm in. Um, and it reminded me of something that my mom used to say when I was growing up, which is, like, when plants suddenly die, it means that they've sacrificed themselves um, to protect you from a spirit that's, like, you know, not looking out for you. <laughs> and uh, I'm wondering, what do you think about this? I asked a friend, and she said her mom had said the same thing, too. And, I mean, both of our moms are Latina. Like, it might be a thing. I, I Googled it, and I can't really find anything. Uh, so what do you think? Can plants see ghosts? I loved this. This is a great call uh, and a great question. Um, I don't know. I, I, I have such bad luck with plants other than like a few real dummy proof plants that maybe I've just been surrounded by ghosts this entire time and I had no idea. I had never heard of this uh, idea before, but now that I have, it's all I want to believe forever now. I have several things to say. I've been sitting here being Please like do. really stewing on it. So I I had not heard of this previously, but I I love plants. I have like maybe too many plants and there have been several times when plants that had been thriving and doing well. I think twice it was jasmine. And actually we moved so we moved into the house that we're in now about 6 years ago and there was like basically like a hedge of jasmine. Um and we have the same – like we have gardeners come once a week. They we, they kind of, you know, had worked for I think the previous two families. They'd been there forever. We hadn't changed the watering schedule. We hadn't changed anything. And there was like this period of time that I think I've talked about on this podcast before where I felt like maybe there was a, a curse placed on me and my family. <laughs> Not like a serious curse but a light curse. But a lot of things were going wrong. And in the middle of this period, the entire hedge of jasmine plants literally overnight died to the point when I was like, did someone like bleach them or something? And we asked the gardeners. They hadn't done anything differently. My kids, I'm always watching my kids when they're in the yard. They hadn't dumped anything on them. And it was seriously spooky. And after that things got a little bit better. But it was weird. Oh, so the jasmine plant sacrificed yes. itself. Sacrifice but That's until we like heard this say. call, I was just like, well, it's another thing that went wrong in a series of a lot of like no, little things going it wrong. it ended the curse. But it may have ended the curse. And then I also Whoa. had an orchid that I had, I think I had gotten right when I moved to L.A., and I had another like super, super bad year, basically like 2009 to like mid-2010, and I had, and this orchid had been doing super well, and like it would, orchids kind of go dormant, and then they come back. But again, it was like, and that took a little longer. It was like over the course of maybe four days. It had always been in the same place. So it was getting the same light, same watering. It just like turned brittle, and it was like it had been like, you know, vexed. It saw a ghost. I think it saw a ghost. So I put on Twitter after we heard this call a a poll asking if when a plant dies suddenly if it maybe was because it saw a ghost or not due to ghosts 48 percent said because it saw a ghost now that was the losing option but by such a small margin i honestly be- <laughs> I now believe i now believe this yeah <laughs> uh, i 100 percent believe that this is a true thing i like the phrasing of not due to ghosts <laughs> <laughs> not due to ghosts <laughs> 
<laughs> Wait, I need to find your poll here. When did you put it up? Is it is it done? Is it closed? It, the poll has been closed. Okay. We can run another poll on that call, though, now that people have more information. About- there were 324 votes, guys. Wow. And it was like a really, it was a tight race. But I was like, yeah. it's true that when a plant, I find that like for house plants, the, the biggest factor in whether or not they survive is light. So if you move to a new sure. house, you're probably getting a different light source, even mm-hmm. off, obviously you were like, oh, the kitchen is a good place for this plant. Maybe in your new place, the kitchen is not a good place for the plant. But usually they'll give you signs that something that they're not liking where they are. And yeah, instead there's something of just gradual. Like, just like dropping dead. Yeah. If you have any stories like this, listeners, would you please yeah, give us a call? Yeah, sudden plant death. Two four zero four six night or night call podcast at gmail because this is like um, this is my new beat, guys. Yeah, let's reiterate <laughs> that not all plant death is necessarily due to seeing ghosts because I don't want anyone Just to like most. attribute most their own plant plant's failure. Some of it's due to the planet dying, but maybe yeah. that's the biggest <laughs> ghost of all. Oh, maybe the ghost <laughs> maybe was the- always there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like those sci-fi <laughs> movies where the ghost is just like a pollen. Uh, speaking of sudden deaths, we all watched the hottest show on Netflix right now, as far as I can tell. Um, I had to wait until I got back and then I had my recuperation day from traveling and watched six out of eight episodes of Russian Doll, the new show from Leslie Headland and Amy Poehler. And who's the third person on Natasha it? Leone. We Yeah, so I watched six out of eight episodes. It is about a woman who mysteriously finds herself dying over and over and over again. And especially the first couple episodes are really about that, really about uh, all the crazy accidental way she dies. And I had uh, crazy nightmares <laughs> last night <laughs> about getting hit by cars over and over and over again. It's colored my reception of the show somewhat, and maybe it'll be a while till I binge something again. But I, I kind of dig it. I still have what I have one more episode to watch. I didn't finish it. Finish it. You also but. had a tweet where you said that you've been hit by a car a few times. Oh yeah, a few times. Oh, yeah. I think we've talked about that. How many times have you been hit by a car? Three times. That's so um, horrible. Yeah, all all on my body. So not so probably like, uh, seeing that is different for you. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of insane that I like to drive as much as I do because I am actually really terrified of cars. Probably in a comparable way to you guys talking about being nervous about flying. That's how I feel about driving. Cars but are I, scary, too. People should be more scared of cars. Car, you can die from a car so <laughs> yeah, much yeah, yeah. more easily. I've been in two car crashes where I'm in the car, and I've been in three uh, accidents where a car has hit my body. Uh Jeez, <laughs> Did you guys know, <laughs> not terrible. the same, but uh, Ariana Grande was hit by a hockey puck twice as a child? Really? I feel yeah. like I've heard this weird fact. She, she has, just like, posted a story about it on her Instagram that's a picture of her as a child riding the Zamboni, and it's like, mm-hmm. Ariana Grande Butera, like, the little girl who was hit by the hockey puck at the Florida Panthers game twice, <laughs> is fine. <laughs> what? Wow. I feel like that can really change your whole I just feel like that's such a good origin story. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Her, and then she could sing like from that right. point on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Russian Doll, uh how how much did you guys watch of it? I got through 4, 6. Okay. Okay. So none of us have made it to the end yet. I find yeah. it in a way it's a really good show to binge because obviously yeah. it's kind of a play on the fact that you're binging it. Um but it also it, it's not as like light of a show as you initially think it is. I mean, I didn't give me nightmares, but eventually I felt like I needed to like take a breather. The emotional intensity is played both for laughs and also is like it just is intense. Oh, it's so after good. A while. It's so dark. It's so I love good. it. It's very. I love Leslie Headland. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Speaking sure. Speaking we everybody. all we all love Leslie Headland. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's very dark and funny, and uh, Natasha Leone is great. Also, special shout out to Greta Lee, who went to high school with yes. me. Shout and out Greta Molly, Lee. We love Greta Lee. And who is, she was a triple threat in high school. She was an amazing <laughs> singer, dancer, and actor. She was so well cast in this. Yeah, she plays Maxine, she's who's the friend. friend. Okay, she's so good. Yeah, she's so she's good. Very, very good. She's, She's um, the best. The casting in this show is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. everybody in the show was great. All the character people. 
are, I, are I really like the guy who plays Alan too. <laughs> he's good. Yeah, that that's who is it? Charlie Barnett. Yeah, everybody yeah. likes him. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Um, um, I did think that the ex John, who's played by Yule Vasquez, you said he's like Chris Noth in season one of Law and Order, which is exactly right. He gave me the diet. Yeah, exactly. I was like, this is the it's diet. The trench Chris coat. Noth. It's the trench coat. Yeah, it's the hair. he's like eighties man. The general. New York, New York, eighties. Yeah. Man. So this show is mm-hmm. the New Yorkiest show. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's. In I think world. it's like so beautifully shot in the it's all the great. outdoor kind of street scenes because it's all a lot of yeah. it takes place at night because that's kind of where she keeps getting dumped every time she has to restart a cycle. So it's all kind of on this Sunday night in New York, and it, it's very atmospheric and uh, makes me appreciate. It's recognizable, but it still feels kind of heightened in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's I like, like it, a lot. it really reminded me of After Hours. Yes, which totally, is obviously totally. A super high compliment. And one of the things that I hear them talking about in a lot of the press for it is just how they were like, how come there's no like 70s movies about just like broads? Yeah, <laughs> right. Just really self destructive ladies. Yeah, um, out on the town. Out on the town. And Natasha Leone obviously is like, Somebody who was a beloved child actor who then had a rough time and was a junkie. I don't know if that comes into play directly in the show, but it obviously seems like that's one of the things the show is a metaphor for. Yes. But I was looking it up because there was that thing. I don't know if you guys remember this, but Michael Rappaport was her landlord once mm-hmm. and wrote Wait. this horrible op-ed for yeah, Jane Magazine. This. Yeah, it was, about, it was brutal. I remember this. It was awful. It was like he was her landlord and he was like, she's a terrible tenant because she's like a junk. It was just like shaming her for being a junkie. And it was really awful. That's horrible. Yeah. And then she did almost die. She had like her lungs collapsed or something yeah. really intense. And so that to all be, happened. We're talking prior. about Natasha Leone, right? I yeah, just want to make that. clear. Well, because then I like looked this? up. I looked up her backstory also, and it was like she was basically – her parents were Orthodox, which is mm-hmm. interesting because there's mm. some stuff about that, some Orthodox people in the show, and that she was basically like liberated from her family by the oh, age really? of 16. Wow. Yeah. yeah. She was very much like a self-made person, I yeah. think, who was like, you know, got into show business. <laughs> um, and I found I found this delightful. Yeah, yeah, it was really it's really good. I also I had just watched Can You Ever Forgive Me and I was like, I love kind of taking like taking the lens of like what's charming about New York and put kind of like grabbing it and giving it to like bitchy complicated ladies. Yes. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Because that's like They're you very know. of a piece these two characters. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's I like, also I I feel like I've said this on the show before, but I really enjoyed The Last OG recently as, like, a New York show that mm-hmm. made me be like, ooh, New York, like, what a wonderful place that yeah. is so <laughs> lovely and atmospheric. And just, like, shows that do the thing people like from Woody Allen movies of people, like, strolling along, having well, that's conversations. that's what I mean, is I was like, you should take that mantle right. and give it to women. Yeah, do it. right. Yeah, and did like, you guys have see them be Private Life, the Tim Jenkins film? That's no, I haven't seen it Netflix. yet. I mean, that's like another good, like, it's like, a, it feels like the Woody Allen movie that I actually want because I'm not that big of a fan of Woody Allen. <laughs> but like, mm-hmm. it's just sort of talky. People haven't, their neuroses about a problem and it's a lot of dialogue stuff, but it just kind of feels like wearing a chunky sweater. That's This was like wearing an itchy jacket, but in but it's like a really <laughs> cool jacket. Yes. You know? Yeah. It also I love it's self referential in like a very smart and good way. And also, um, I like how they like blew their budget on the Harry Nelson. The Harry Nelson Nils- this is what I was gonna talk about. Yeah, that's like all their budget. It's cause every episode yeah. they have to pay for the rights for it. Well, there was a maximum number of time they, times that they were allowed to use it. Yeah. Uh, so you'll notice it peters out after a while. And then they have um, Alan, who's like the character who comes in and he's in a similar predicament. And his song is a Beethoven concerto because it's like free. In the public domain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was also just like funny. And I mean, it's such a perfect choice of songs to yeah. like have Harry Nielsen in there, who's so great. Um, but yeah, such a good show. I'm all, I always go into these shows that are like being – I think it has like a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes and I, I always am just like, no, oh, when, I will be the rain cloud Also like when this. Netflix is advertising something to me on the front page, yeah. that like puts me off it. Yes, exactly. I, you know what puts me <laughs> off to it though is 
not 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 just the putting it on the front page or suddenly everybody's talking about it, but that there's usually I feel like for me there's no forewarning about it. Like they're suddenly there, right, yeah. and suddenly it's like, oh, there's this thing that everybody's talking about. I had no idea to even be anticipating a new show starring Natasha Lyonne and like right. produced by Amy Poehler. That would have been something I would have liked to know about a couple <laughs> weeks ago. And now apparently I'm totally behind the game. Not that I need to be on top of the game with TV. I, f- I feel like I've taken that pressure off myself like years ago. But still, it's like the sort of like suddenly everybody seemingly has watched the whole thing over the course of two days and you have to catch up i don't know that's why we we like wait a week on this jazzy podcast i I wonder what would happen if someone started a streaming service that had like it was just a dump where they never (laughs) told you anything that was gonna happen and Uh there was no marketing once it did Uh, and they just put everything they lumped it all are you revealing night dump (laughs) dump. well now that you want to roll it out like this it's blowing the no pr angle it's like a dumpster full of videos it's a dumpster full of videos well because i've been for like the longest time i've been pushing we live tweet the location yeah right whoever gets there first Gets all the copies of, you get the content. Get scent of a woman. But I was really like with um, too many cooks, which I talk about every third episode of this podcast. <laughs> the dream of like, the tw- early 2010s is alive it's on all Night I Call. Talk about it, in a way. <laughs> but too many cooks. I was like, where's why aren't things dealt with? Why is not everything like too many cooks? Where you don't know what it is, you don't know why it's there. There's, it's like you'll talk about it afterwards, but ideally no one who's been involved See, this comments is what on I it at all. I have been saying, which is that what people really want is to watch television that's been programmed for them. Yes. <laughs> like it used to be of like, here's a show. Now here's another show. You don't really get to choose. You don't get yeah. to choose. I think we should start this and we should call it you get what you get and you don't get upset. And it's just <laughs> Molly just like real back and bonked her head. Oh, that's how that's genius what we're gonna talk. No, it's just head. amazing also, that you've been saving on. that in your back pocket this whole yeah, time. Yeah. Well, also, I just legit we were, snorted <laughs> <laughs> not in an affected way. Tess is uh, wearing fingerless gloves. I'm she like announced gloves. when I saw her and I like almost sliced my finger off last night, which is also we're falling what, apart. We're like, is this because we're watching Russian Doll or yeah. is it yeah. because we're like aware of it because we're watching Russian Doll? Yeah. I'm not getting into any staircases anytime soon. <laughs> no. No. And it's funny that the stair, the stair got her every time and didn't get the other guy. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Sorry. Well, very important. It's spoiler. also nice because this show is very much like everybody's probably like big chill age. Yes. And you're like, oh, this is the recognizable reality where people are still having like birthday parties for themselves. Okay, but wait, that's not a recognizably realistic birthday party, <laughs> Molly. What, that somebody would make you chicken? I would make you chicken. A lavish party at a loft where everyone like sleeps together after eating chicken. And that's what cake. I imagine New York is like. It, Emily, fact check. Yes, I do that every night. Uh, <laughs> a new chicken and a new, a new warm body every night. Nice. <laughs> Two Good, warm okay. bodies. One Two is the chicken's bo- body. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's new york <laughs> i was very drawn in also by the lost cat narrative aspect oatmeal which is a yeah. very cute cat uh yeah. an extremely cute cat good cat, cat casting on russian doll yeah um, there were a few moments when i was like i'm i'm in on this show one of them was i think it's in the first episode she goes i'm in the game right yes. i'm michael douglas yeah. and that yeah. made me laugh so hard <laughs> but i um, was like i'm all in I have yet to see how it all pans out, but like, I really like between trying to figure out what it's about and whether it's about like coding and gaming, which is her job in it. So that right. was like kind of a hint for that. And then whether it's about um, like psychotherapy, on the other hand, those are like the two things I've been bouncing between thinking about in the context of the show, which is sort of fun to think about them in tandem. But it really does feel like it's more about the latter near the end as far as like, especially, and no spoilers, but just like playing things over and over and like trying to process things in a way. That, that, yes. Yeah. Which and is- also the the therapist um, who's played by Elizabeth Ashley, who's so, so good, 
Uh, yeah, where did yeah. she come from? I forget. I looked her. I looked her up. Because she feels I was like, like you know her. She feels like you know her better than you do. Well, she but, sounds yeah. kind of like um, Candace Bergen sounds now, like her um, or somebody. I feel like I was maybe somebody who is in Book Club, which was like one of the best movies of last year that nobody talked <laughs> yes. about. But, uh, well, again, it's like people that you know in real life. This is the thing: is you're like everybody. That's what the show is about. Also, too, is it's like everybody in real life knows like women over the age of whatever that are like cool and interesting and people but there's like none of them in movies and tv Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so when you see them in things like this or like in slums of beverly hills which was natasha leone's big breakout yeah you're like oh like real people yes also i love that the women are cast to be these kind of like sparkling, interesting, layered people. And then the male characters are just like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you got a good line about Columbo because uh, he's wearing a trench coat. But I was like, this is I loved seeing the men as accessories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It does um, kind of feel like Alan is going to be like an NPC, like a non-player character, just because of yeah. his apartment. It's like he's like a sim, uh, but I don't know. He is. Hey, speaking of sims and uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no. I know we want segue. any excuse to talk about the sims. But <laughs> there was a good sims article about oh. how. Fucking love sims. It was about something fucked up about it. I thought it was interesting. Oh, it was Sim City. Yeah. Oh, Sims in the City. No, but how Sim City is um, like a capitalist nightmare horror thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember how scary it was when like an uh, uh, like a hurricane would come to your Sim City on like the old DOS one? Oh yeah, and there would be this horrible sound like. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe your Sim City saw a ghost. I don't know. Maybe so. (laughs) Oh hey, speaking of terrifying things, why don't we take a night call? Oh, it's actually a night email. So you can ooh again. Spooky. Okay, nice. Uh, Here, I'll read it because it's right on my phone right here. Hello, night folks. I just finished listening to the alt milk convo at the end of the new episode, and the question of whether or not spider silk milk exists had me trying to figure out where I'd heard that before. It turns out I think it's this with a link that we will put somewhere in the show notes. Because spider silk is so strong but inefficient to harvest from spiders, some folks made goats make it via their milk. Goat milk, while not my favorite to drink necessarily, is tip-top for yogurts and cheeses and all that, and apparently for producing spider silk. Best, Daniel. This is true, Fun. and this blows my mind. I This is what I was sort of indirectly referencing mm-hmm. when I said that there was spider silk milk was that that there were these goats who were genetically modified to make spider silk in their milk. Yes. That's what it is, is that it's like they squirt out the milk and then you turn the milk into the spider. There's proteins. They're They're like spider goats. They're like the closest thing to Spider-Man that actually exists in real life. So I guess the deal is that scientists were like, okay, so spider silk is really strong and elastic and they wanted to use – they wanted to use it to make artificial ligaments and like suture eyes and make bulletproof vests and all this crazy stuff. And they they were like, great, we'll get a spider farm where we have so many spiders spinning, spinning, spinning all the day. But then the spiders were just like, didn't no. like to be near I'm other spiders tired. and they ate each other. <laughs> they just ate each other and they were like, all right, next in line. That's a problem with your goats. workforce sometimes. Well, also yeah. maybe the spiders had, yeah, maybe it was bad work conditions for the spiders. Yeah, the spiders were like, we don't have to spin for you. For 24 hours a day? No way. <laughs> Um, I'm so I'm so sad that I missed food moods um, when you guys had your podcast by yourself. I, I just well, I, I really love this new addition to the Night Call family. Uh, well, guess what? It's back right now. Food moods. Food moods. With Emily. Emily, you had expressed interest in. Um, in talking about how you're trying to get spracked? Oh, yes. Well, this was a discussion because Molly was talking about milk tea. This was a revelation to me that it is mostly vegan. That opens up a whole new world to me because I've never had milk tea because I figured I couldn't. And I haven't had Thai iced tea for a zillion years, even though I love it so very much. It's so sugary and caffeinated and good. 
Um, I feel like I mentioned on here before that right now I'm in a matcha latte phase, which is a very expensive habit. Um, and I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't because my brain is broken and I'm tired all the time. I OD'd on matcha. I had a bad matcha encounter. And She's I had done to with stop. matcha now. <laughs> See, I feel like I've been chasing a dragon with matcha because I had one that was really poorly made at Pan Quotidian where the lady clearly did not know what she was doing. She just like took like what looked like a third a cup of, of, of matcha powder and just like plonked it in some hot um, a bad matcha latte and it was like well but but it ended up being guys the, i feel the like we always end up just talking ever. it was oh because it was so sugary no it wasn't sugary it was so matcha -y. it was like oh. it was like well, you could the purest high i've ever had in my life it was full body I, I, was, I was gonna say i feel like we always just end up talking shit about le pen quotidien here on this podcast I'm, i am always done. i have Look. i have nothing bad to say about pen quotidien <laughs> well i've got plenty so i'll <laughs> save it <laughs> is molly right in between is this a of is course this, okay of course. great, great, what do you, great how do you think yeah um the, the perfect venn diagram night call yeah great <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, uh, so that's been my thing lately. Well, check out milk tea because it blows your brain a little bit. Have you ever much, thought about almost. just eating espresso beans? I, mean, I know that's a very 90s thing Does that to work? Say. Yeah. You, yeah, it does. There's, a, it, it, there's different qualities, uh, to getting spracked. And I feel like at a certain point, the caffeine, the coffee caffeine thing is just a kind of body and heart thing and not Do you fuck a brain with cold thing. brew? Yes, I fuck with cold brew, but not past like 2 p.m. See? Have you <laughs> gone, have you tried bulletproof? Yes, I is that have. The butter coffee? That's, bulletproof that's the is grass fed br butter. Bulletproof coffee. coffee is very good. You can also do so it good. with uh, coconut oil. What? I read um, that article about that guy in the New Yorker that one time. You don't buy time. it from the guy. You just but make it yourself. A, that guy, he it's, was it's such as a if scammer. I was the main thing. No, but his, it was such bullshit. He was but, like, yeah. "Oh, it's like the butter bio essences into the coffee." He was such a scammer that I yeah. was like, "Fuck this well, shit." Well, I don't buy his stuff. But uh, the main thing, and this is the takeaway: this is anytime there's a like a bullshit um, food trend. Uh, going on that like claims to do one thing or another. I feel like I'm pretty good at like trying it, and being open minded, and figuring out what the actual base principle that's not bullshit is. So in the case of bulletproof coffee, I think the important thing, and I do this generally, is that you need to have some fat at the beginning of the day, um, especially with caffeine. Like you need to have yeah. some fat to just like give some the caffeine something to like glue onto. This is not scientific. The fat's that, like a but car that drives the thing. Yeah, that, like, yeah. You can put milk. Yeah. Put milk in the coffee. If but you're using it, whole fat milk, whole fat, yeah. non-fat milk is not going to do it. And even what like two percent is not milk. enough. Has, yeah. Full fat coconut milk. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But does it, does coconut milk have the same omega threes? I, I feel know. like coconut milk has everything. Because the deal is it has to be grass-fed milk because it has, like, the omega-3. We're going to solve the milk problem. We are. But the real oh. thing that's wonderful is to please advertise with us Nutribullet, my favorite product that I own in my home. It's I, I've, I've had one for six or seven years now, and it hasn't failed me yet. It is, like, the best thing in the world. But that's what I put my coffee in if I've done the bulletproof thing, which I haven't done in a while. But when I did do it... I would put it in that, and it just like made into this delicious, like frothy, fatty cup of coffee. <laughs> it was okay. so good. Don't don't you think people just what we enjoy about all of these things is like the ritualism? Yeah, some some of it is due to that. But I found so I made the switch over to full fat milk a couple years ago. Have not turned back, yeah. and I honestly do think that there's something to. If you're getting grass-fed milk that's full fat and you're putting it in coffee and drinking a ton of coffee is another key factor is that you have to be drinking a lot, a ton yeah. of coffee. <laughs> uh, but I, I did notice that it made me feel more coffeeed up. Mm -hmm. more quickly mm -hmm. <laughs> than when I had been doing the low-fat milk in my coffee. By the way, guys. Now that we're talking about brands uh, taking over food, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we got a night call that references our big kale conspiracy mm -hmm. discussion from last week. I think this belongs in food moves. Oh, absolutely. Can we read yeah. it? A night kale, would you say? A night? Oh, nice one. So this night email comes to us from Grant, pronounced Grant. Thank you, Grant. 
Uh, Dear ladies of Night Call, big fan of the podcast, been following you gals since Grantland. Wanted to reach out because the previous episode, Molly and Tess mentioned the rise of kale and how it is bullshit. My girlfriend, shout out to Karina, pronounced Karina, sorry, shout out to Karina, turned me on to a podcast called Why We Eat What We Eat. In one episode, they take a deep dive into the rise of kale and how a single woman is behind it all, Oberon Sinclair. I mean everything, even the American Kale Association. I am providing a link to the podcast. It's only 20 minutes long. I suggest you ladies give it a listen. More people need to know the truth about big kale. Thank you, Grant. Did you guys listen to this? I haven't yet, but I plan to because I was also – there were several articles written, um, I think, like a year ago. Yeah, or there's this ago. one in paper here. It's yes. Um, um, and it talks about how, yeah, this was like a big PR push for her. But there was also a f- like a farmer who made too much kale and made these shirts that said eat more kale mm-hmm. just to get rid of the kale that he or she yeah. had made. Yeah. I dipped a toe in. I have more reading on it tonight. Oberon Sinclair. I know. Um, I, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember in high school, I worked at a deli uh, or like I worked in the, the deli case of the grocery store and I just knew of kale as a thing. We'd just be sent out into the produce section to grab because it was like 50 cents a bunch. And we would just use it as garnish on a big like bowl of Jello salad. Um, just kind of like wedge it in the side. And that's like my only, that was my only uh, knowledge of what kale was good for for a very long time. Well, would you guys like to hear some kale facts yes, and please. also some PR mm-hmm. facts about food that yes. I'm learning from this article called The Strange Mystery of Who Made Kale Famous. Um, apparently, kale jumped by 60% between 2007 and 2012. Before that, the largest buyer of kale was Pizza Hut. But apparently, orange juice was created by ad agency Lord & Thomas to help the California Fruit Growers Exchange Utilize an overabundance of citrus trees in 1907. Wow. The concept drink an orange made orange juice a staple morning drink. Oh, my God. Do you remember when you were a kid and you saw the Tropicana ads with the orange with the straw stuck yes. in it? And you were just like, great, I'm going to try that next time. Yeah. No, of course. And so your many. parents were like, no, it won't work. And I was like, oh, why? And there was a woman, Linda Resnick, who oh, was yeah. behind the, the pomegranate, pomegranate movement. Yeah. Oh, palm. Yeah. The palm wonderful, wonderful. The wonderful company or whatever they're called. Okay. Oberon Sinclair, founder of My Young Auntie PR in New York City, with a client list including Hermé, Vivienne Westwood, and Jack Spade, was hired by the American Kale Association in 2013 to make kale cool. But that doesn't seem right if it started in 2007. Mm, That's about when I feel like – I mean, when I started eating kale, it was because I was dating a very crunchy vegan and it was like the cheapest thing and we would just have it all the time. Yeah, vegans have always loved yeast kale. All over it and yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I feel like it became cool somewhat after that, you know, around 2009 or something like that. It's a very post recession food, I feel like. The American Kale Association doesn't exist. <laughs> what? Um, Go on. Okay. So this person like talked to Oberon Sinclair who was like, I made kale cool by putting it on like the menu of all these trendy New York restaurants and Uh like guerrilla marketing it. And then he had a call scheduled with Drew Ramsey, assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University and the founder of National Kale Day and the writer of Fifty Shades of Kale. He said, (laughs) I've heard heard that before. Uh, (laughs) Have you talked to anyone at the American Kale Association? I'm not sure they exist. Whoa. Um, Apparently, she and then the writer said they'd assumed the American Kale Association was a group of kale farmers. But in fact, the opposite is true. Many kale farmers are actually suffering from kale's sudden popularity. The demand is rising, but the supply is outpacing it. It's like quinoa. It's like all all these Mm -hmm. other crops. I have to just say that I am going to be a champion for parsley right now. I love parsley. I'm going to call. No, everyone does. And that's because it is. Isn't cilantro more controversial? Yes. I'm saying parsley is completely uncontroversial. It has more vitamins and minerals than kale. It's so good for you. It is great for your stomach. It's great for your breath. It gets rid of garlic. parsley. It gets rid if of you garlic. Have really and bad it's garlic easy breath. to grow. Yeah. Yes, you got to go with the parsley. So I'm going to go ahead and call it now that I'm going to do for parsley 
as a hobby, you know, just out of the kindness of my heart, I'm going to elevate it past kale. We're going to cream kale with parsley. I can see it having an arugula like place in um, the American right? consciousness, sort of a spicy green that you can use as a base wonder, for a salad. I you wonder could who tempura was... fry it. That would be oh good. yeah. Oh, Who's you can. I've had arugula. that. It's very good. That, is it good? Yes, it's it quite good. Really good. Um, Thought I invented it. Damn it. <laughs> tempura is, parsley. Yeah. This is the thing about any of these foods, though, including quinoa and especially including kale, is that a lot of times when these foods are introduced and they're made into things that you like are supposed to eat all the time because it's cool or somebody tells you it's going to make you like live forever or whatever the case might be or make your skin beautiful people do not get educated properly on how to prepare it there's so many stupidly prepared kale salads i bought a salad once somewhere in la this last trip out i can't remember it was just like a raw like chunks of raw kale in the salad and i actually like rolled up my sleeve i put in the dressing that came with it and i massaged it myself like (laughs) because you can't eat just like raw kale like that unless it's very fine people don't know that people don't care because it's also like if you're selling something as being super healthy then like the more more unpleasant it is people are like yeah "Yeah, give it to me oh it must be working Uh, yeah to me the idea of someone else massaging my kale is like too gross oh no i'm fine with it well that's that's why that's why kale is so funny is because it's marketing it's all just marketing it's just like a tough green yeah that's been marketed it's just leafy broccoli that's all that it is Broccoli is Broccoli's so much better. Mm. Yeah. I have to really stand for broccoli here. I love broccoli. Mm. I grow my own broccoli now. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Well, I hope, it, I hope it doesn't see any ghosts. I hope it doesn't <laughs> see a ghost. But it, I would rather it see a ghost than me see a ghost. So if that's what, if that's how it has to be, that's how it has to I be. Want, I want a, a pin now of Tessa's petrified broccoli. Like uh, really I, I can do that for you. Oh, did you guys see the ghost apples? Did I send you the ghost apples? No. It was so cool. It was going around. It was a place where the apples froze, but they were full of water, and then the like skin rotted off. But they're just like yes, I saw ice this. hanging in the shape of apples. Did you also what? see the thing about uh, after the rain in California, all these strawberries were left on the beach in Ventura? Yeah, the beach strawberries. Whoa, <laughs> we'll put beautiful! Both. This is the best food news of the past week. I have to say, <laughs> it is. Food news land art is where all yeah. of our interests lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I call would like to get into some some land art if you want us to come draw squiggles yeah. on some beaches for you. For real. If you want us to do that, please give us a call at <laughs> 24046 <laughs> night or email us at nightcallpodcast at gmail.com. Also, please follow us on social media. We are Nightcall Pod on Twitter, Nightcall Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And if you haven't already, please rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. For it's a sure. nice thing to do. Yeah, I want to mention uh, the writer Audrey Wallen made a meme once that was about how men don't own the void, and it had a bunch of land art made by men yes. with, that was crossed well, out. And Audrey said, Wallen is how I know about the strawberries on the beach. <laughs> oh, cool. We here at Night Call agree <laughs> that uh, women own the void. Which women is- own the void. Give us the void. <laughs> <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> I also enjoyed all the parts in Russian Doll where she was like, I'm the abyss. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did too. Good show, Russian Doll. Very Pacino-y. Very Pacino. Good show. And gr- and honestly, her hair is so great. And it made me, again, long for curly hair because I would so go wrong. so hard you into would curly not, bangs. You have no idea. I hope we Freaky Friday so you can see how much you don't I've want it. I've been hoping we Freaky Friday since day one. So <laughs> it, eventually it'll happen. <laughs> can we do a three a Freaky Friday? A Freaky Friday. <laughs> it's a secret Santa. A Freaky Thursday. <laughs> it would be a Freaky Thursday. And Thursday is a great day to switch. I think because freaky with fr- when it's have, Freaky Friday, you have the whole weekend. That's what I'm saying. When when it's when it's you're not rushed. Thursday, you're not rushed on Sunday. You get to experience a little work, you know, and a little play. And I like. I think that's a good balance when you're switching bodies with a friend. It's over. (laughs) (laughs) Shout out to Homestar Running. Strong back, yeah. (laughs) This is basically Teen Girl Squad, the podcast. It is. (laughs) 
I showed my six year old son Teen Girl Squad, and he was kind of like equal parts. Like, what is this? What is? Where is more of this? It's like when I found my parents' alternative yeah, comics. Yeah, oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> tried to hide from me. It's our, yeah. it's our art um, from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that was a good. That was a good end of the show. Fake out, mm-hmm. and then we came back for one last. That's segment. right. And we, now we're gone again. We end every week, but we come back. We come back. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Night Call.